Hey, what is up everyone? Today I'm taking a look at this ride here, which of course is the very first real grade of all time, the RX-78 II. Now let's check it out. Man, real grade. Real grade is 11 years old this year. It was to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Gunpla. Last year was the 40th anniversary of Gunpla. And man, time flies by. It's not even funny. This is a kit that I have bought before, gave away before, and have always meant to get around to building because it is the progenitor to what, well, I call early real grade syndrome, which is what happens to some early real grades over time after you build them, and that is they get a little bit on the floppy side. And just in case you're not all that familiar with real grade kits, which you probably are, the kind of shtick behind these is twofold. One, they're meant to look like what a Gundam or mobile suit would look like in real life. I'm going to assume that the RX-78 II here is heavily based on the original Gundam statue that was in Shizuoka in Japan. I've got absolutely no reason to think that besides it looks just like it and has that kind of a life-like vibe. The other aspect about these kits is they had a fully pre-built internal skeleton. And that's why it says it on the box, even to this day when the kits technically do not have one. Just like it says right there in the front of the box, the movable range, which is wide as possible, was mounted on the assembled inner frame, which is simply cut out. And what that means is, what we get in here is something called the advanced joint. This was the first ever one of these, and all you have to do is simply snip it off the runners and put it all together, and you've essentially got the bones of what is going to be your model kit. This is a mind-blowing awesome idea, but the kind of plastic this is made out of, which is kind of like a soft plastic that's somewhere between the standard Gundam inner frame polystyrene and a polycap. So over time, if you move these a lot, they kind of degrade a little bit in all of, well, the structural aspects of the kit and that leads to ERS. But yeah, that is enough about real grades and everything about them and the fact that this could end up being a floppy mess. Let's get right into it and check it out. This video was sponsored by Boksu, a monthly snack box subscription service that delivers original assortments of premium Japanese snacks and tea pairings. Bokusu honors Japanese heritage by working with 100 plus year old family snack makers to deliver authentic Japanese exclusive snacks to your door. Every month you will receive a box with a different theme so snacks will always be different. It's a gourmet journey through Japan. Previous themes included Haunted Harvest, Tokyo Summer and Winter in Hokkaido. A new themed box every month shipped from Japan with free shipping to the US. I lived in Japan for 6 years so this box really did remind me of what I missed the most. The food! The nuance, balance and the unmistakable artisanal craft of Japanese food is off the charts. First time customers will receive this Seasons of Japan box that takes you through Japan's 4 distinct seasons while taking you on an epicurean journey across Japan. Spring captures the essence of Hanami, the viewing of cherry blossoms. In here we get crispy stick potato with the sourness of umeboshi, real strawberries infused with white chocolate retaining the best aspects of both, squishy mochan dango mochi and a delicate pear biscuit. Summer brings the heat of Japanese summer festivals, matsuri, edamame senbei crackers, sake with a twist of Japanese yuzu citrus, tangy rich tonkatsu sauce flavored don don yaki and my favorite out of the whole box, seaweed tempura. Crunchy, salty with a punch of sudachi citrus, that is so addictive, I wish this bag was at least 100 times the size it is. Autumn Japanese food by far is my favorite and Boksu did not disappoint. These Hokkaido red bean donuts were the most legit Japanese snack I've had since leaving Japan. The Aomori apple caramel cookie is the softest decadent cookie I've ever savaged in milliseconds. Next a weird moist matcha chocolate stick cake. Finished off with a black sesame drum. Finishing off the year is winter. Light mochi puffs with a cloud-like texture. Get my cha which infuses Japanese green tea with roasted brown rice. And an airy chocolate wafer celebrating New Year's. Honestly, this box is the bomb and I need more. So if you want to try this out for yourself, you can get 10% off your own authentic Japanese snack box from Boksu and save up to $47 using my code and link down there in the description box. While also supporting the channel. So jumping right into what we get in the box and there is the real grade or XM-2 with absolutely everything that it comes with. And what we've got in here is the basic Gundam loadout of the Bazooka, Rifle, Pair of Beam Sabers, The Shield, Core Fighter, Real Grade Style Posable Alternate Hands, a Base Adapter and a 144th Scale Amuro. But before we take a look at all of that, let's check out the real grade or XM-2 itself. 
In here we have a total of 10 runners, A and C rocking some serious variation in colors. And this kit did harken in their real grade multiple shades of certain colors. We've got two shades of blue, as well as three shades of white, which is pretty awesome. So jumping right on into the aesthetics now, and there is the real great Oryx 78 II Granddaddy Gundam out of the box snapped together with a bit of extra effort. And I have to say, I am blown away by how good this looks. There are real grades that have come out after this that do not look this phenomenal. It's glossy, it's got so many different shades of white on it that are just separated in a perfect kind of way. And there's just an awesome technical aspect to this kit that isn't really present in any other 144th scale Oryx 78 II. The only thing that would come close and maybe look a little bit better, maybe, would be the Master Grade 3.0. But before I say anything else, let's talk about what I did to it. So first off, this wouldn't be a real grade without a metric truck ton of stickers, and I did use one or two, but I did not use them all. Just ones that would make it look, well, quite pleasant, but not a little bit over the top, if you get what I mean. So I don't really think there is a too many decals situation, maybe there is, but the thing is with the real grade kits, the stickers do kind of stand out a little bit when you get in close to the edges. So I chose some of the ones that got in the shoulder that were fitted to the area. These are not just squares with text on them like a lot of decals are. These are fitted to the little piece of plastic they stick to, so you don't really see the outer aspect of the sticker. You do on some of the smaller ones like on the knees and the front skirting there, but once again, if you wanted to, you could painstakingly cut each one of these out so it has no border, but that would take a lot of time. But what I do want to mention right here is, I was using some of the gold stickers. I did use the ones inside the chest venting, and they didn't really sit right for me. I didn't do a great job of it, so I pulled them out. And I also realized that with a lot of other real grades I have, and the Master Grade 3.0, these sort of stickers degrade a lot, especially on the joints, where they will be moving and rubbing over the sticker. So I just went ahead and painted them. So I did use a lot of Gundam markers in this build, so let's talk about them a bit. So in this build, what I did was use these two sets of Gundam markers and this panel liner right here. So for the panel lines, I used a black pore style panel liner, this one right here. I will throw a link in the description if you want to check it out yourself, but this kit does have some extremely shallow panel lines like the ones on the side of the calves. So I had to use one of the fine liner style ones to do those. Otherwise, this one just, it just wouldn't flow through them. I also use this set of pore style panel liners as well with this kit. The eraser in here is great. It just basically does the job that you could do with alcohol or lighter fluid, but it's just very clean and easy to do. And it will clean up any little marks that you make or any spills on the kit. And I do always find these ones up here a whole lot of fun because these are panel liners as well. The pore style just in a whole bunch of colors. I use brown on some of the reds as well as on some of the yellow, and I use the blue on the light blue. Last of them, because I did not feel like using the foil stickers on this kit, I went with the gold one from this metallic Gundam marker set. So that is what you're seeing there on the inside of the elbow. This turned out a whole lot better than I expected. I don't have the most uh, deft hands around, and it was still super easy to do. It's almost like surface tension keeps the paint from spilling over the lines, or should I say the edges on you, and at the same time it dries up pretty quick and very very clean. It turned out, hey, better than expected. But anyway, time to jump into that full 360 degree spin and I'll throw up an image of what the RX-78 II should look like on the side so you can compare and contrast. So this is fantastic looking. The multiple shades of white, including an almost yellowy one on the calves and around on the back of the legs, actually pretty much everywhere, gives this a whole lot of dimension that a lot of later real grades do not have. Sure, we do see a lot of dual tone whites in real grades, but this has a tri-tone white that looks phenomenal. The technical visual aesthetic on this is so nice. I will mention that there are some difficult aspects in the build because there's a lot of small panels that kind of barely hold on here and there. I haven't moved it around yet to check out its ability to hold together, but it was a fun build, took a little longer than I expected, and it looks obscenely good. Once again, pretty much like the old 1-1 scale Gundam that would have been back in Shizuoka and in Odaiba quite a few years ago. So because there's a lot of 144 scale granddaddies out there, there it is first side by side with the Revive. Next up then, there is the Beyond Global. And finally, the only normal one I have then is the no grade version of that big moving Gundam, which I think is the F-00. The next kits are a little unusual for some reason or another, so they don't really directly compare. Like, for example, the Christmas version of the entry grade and what has happened to my origin, which is that 
right there, where you should get another high-grade origin just to have in its classic state. And as for the G40, well, I have no idea where that is hiding. So now moving on to the accessories, and once again, here's a bit of an overview of absolutely everything that comes in the box. Now let's check them out one at a time. So as for hands, what we get in here is a pair of solid fists. Now these cannot hold on to anything. These are just for, I guess, punching, posing. As for swapping hands out in this kit, it is very simple. They're just ball joints, pop them off, pop them back on again. The second style of hand we get in here is the real grade style hands. Now these are posable to some degree. We've got a whole bunch of jointing so we can move the thumb separately, the index finger, and the last three fingers. Every finger in here does have a bend in the middle, so it does have a single joint in order to bend. Of course, the three fingers that are attached together are always attached together, so they can bend, but they bend together. And as cool as these are from a technical perspective, they're a bit of a jack of all trades and a master of none. So they don't really do anything great, but they don't really extremely suck at anything. Well, maybe a little bit. So now taking a look at the beam sabers, and we've got two sets with this kit. Well, two sets of handles. The handles up here on the shoulders aren't actually for using in the hands. These have a little bit of a tab hole in the side here. Whereas the ones that we're gonna use, those actually have a peg like what you're seeing right there. Attaching these into the little real great hands is simple. The peg just goes into the hole in the palm of the hands and then you just wrap the fingers around them. Now something you might notice about these particular beams is they're absolutely huge. They're so long. These are more like the length of a pair of master grade beam sabers and I know they have reduced the size of the beams in real grade kits since, but these may or may not be to your taste, but it is worth knowing, they're very long. Like I mentioned, the handles can be stored up on the backpack like so, but these aren't the ones that you use in the hands. Next up in here, we've got that beam rifle, and getting this into the hands is mildly infuriating, to say the least. It is really tough. You have to get that little peg that folds out into the palm of the hand, which is quite loose and moves around a lot. You need to get the index finger into the trigger section and the thumb around the back of the grip all at the same time while trying to wrangle that peg into the palm of the hand. Not easy, but once you do get it on there, it does look really good. There are a couple of seam lines to clean up on this particular rifle, but it is a beautiful little Oryx 78 2 beam rifle. The hand does look okay holding it, not great. I'm more of a fan of fixed pose hands, honestly, because they do the job better and look better, but this does do what it needs to do. I'll also mention this does have a side-to-side -side moving handle, like a lot of beam rifles do. Oh yeah, this sight does the same as well. So next up in here, we've got that bazooka, and just like with the beam rifle, this is an absolute nightmare to get into the palm of the hand. Not as bad as the beam rifle because you don't have any trigger section to get the finger into, but it's still pretty difficult. Once you've got it in there, it's a little bit of an ordeal once again to get that wrangled up onto the shoulder without this thing, well, being as flimsy as it is without it falling apart. Once you do get up there though, it does look quite good. It is a nice bazooka. There is a lot of seam lines in some areas because some parts of this kit are made in ABS, which is more prone to mold lines, sorry, not seam lines. And the rear magazine section of this with the missiles inside, that is very nicely detailed. That looks really cool, both from a distance and up close. Next up then, here is the shield, and this attaches on really well. After the last couple of things, I expected this to be a bit botchy, but it is not. This has an attachment point for the forearm that is quite unique. It is just a flat little slot, and we have a handle that can be held in the hand. This is in the exact same awesome shades of color we saw on the mobile suit, including that nice deep red, but around on the underside, this does look incredibly flat and boring for something that is a real great, but on the whole, it's pretty good. As for the storage of all of the weapons and equipment, if you turn around the Gundam, you can open up its butthole twice, and this is where you can stick in the bazooka when it is not in use. As for the rifle that can be attached onto the rear side of the shield, it has a tab on the side in which to do that, and if you don't like storing the beam sabers up on the backpack like we've had for all of this review, you can actually stick them to the inside of the shield as well just like what you're seeing right here. So next up in here, we've got a 144th scale fully transforming core fighter. It's hard not to be impressed by this. Sure, it is absolutely tiny. That does mean it is extremely, extremely delicate, but the color separation on this, as far as I can see, is 100% perfect. It looks beautiful, and the detailing is insane. We've got an opening cockpit, removable landing gears, and it is beyond impressive. Transforming the core fighter is super simple. You just Fold in the wings, fold down that little fin on the back, push in the front, and then fold the front forward, and we've got a nice little compact unit. 
Seems to be a little bit of a theme, but swapping out the core block for the core fighter was a little bit different. So much so I had to check the manual 10 times, wondering if this actually comes out or not, because a lot of this segment is present on the advanced joint runner. So you're kind of pulling it out for the first time here, if you haven't done it previously, and it is a bit stiff. So this part does come out. You can swap it with the core fighter transformed. It can just be a bit difficult to remove the core block segment. And also I will mention when you do remove this, you are removing two ball joints. So I assume it's going to limit the articulation at the waist ever so slightly. And speaking of the articulation, well, we'll talk about the articulation after one final accessory. That little segment around back here where we stuck in the bazooka, this is actually where you stick in the base adapter, which has a square hole. So yeah, this is a very unique base adapter right here. So now moving on to the articulation, and I find the build of this actually a little more, well, structurally sound than I thought it would be. I thought it would be more like some other early real grades that fall apart a lot. It does fall apart a bit, just not as much as I thought it would. But we're about to find out for definite because it is articulation time. I'm going to stick to the old rule of if something falls off this kit while I'm doing the articulation, it's staying off. And that way we can see just how structurally sound this kit right here is. So we do have a double jointed neck that looks up a lot, but barely looks down at all. I had to check multiple times with this kit that I had the head on, right? Because it can't look down, well, at all for whatever reason. The bottom joint will not allow it to look down. We've got left, right, and all the way around. At the shoulder here, we do have a little bit of forward and back, but not a whole lot. We have full rotation at this point right here. As for raising the arm, we've got T-pose and beyond, so not too bad all the way up. Next up, we've got the full spin at the upper arm, a double jointed, fairly nice bend at the elbow. I do find it catches sometimes when you try to bring it down and you end up with that locking right there. We just need to push the elbow in and it is fine. Next up then is ball joint wrist. Those fingers fell right off, very delicate. Even though I stuck the core block back in, there is no ab crunch. We do get a bit to the back but no ab crunch. If I pull out that opening cockpit, can we get a little bit more? Not really. Next up, there isn't really much side to side in the actual torso itself, but there's quite a bit in the waist segment there. As for the rotation, it only goes from there to there. We lost a skirting armor. As for the skirting, when it is attached, it is a ball joint, it can move up like so. Very, very delicate. Next up, as for the side skirting armor, it can move up like so, as well as a little bit forward and a little bit back. Back here, we do have the double premium butt flap. It lifts up like the front skirting. I lost one down and up. Might as well hold it in while you're moving it. There is no movement to the hip joint. It's just a peg in a hole rotating the way it do. And what gets us is that kick all the way up to the front unobstructed because he's lost his uh, front flap. There it is out to the back. The leg did kind of twist its way off. While I was kicking, not unusual for an early real grade. As for the splits, it will not get past those skirtings, but hey, that counts in my opinion. We do not have the full spin kick up top, we just have from there to there, that is all. When it comes to the bend at the knee, it goes, ooh, nice splitting armor. Is that meant to do that? There we go, that's splitting an awful lot. Is that meant to happen? But yeah, there is the bend, that split is a bit, well, you know. From a basic armor perspective, that doesn't seem like the greatest engineering. I'm gonna try the other leg. Yeah, that bends a lot. That is impressive that it does move like that. That is pretty cool. Not practical, but cool. The splitting armor also extends to down here, and I have to say that is impressive looking, that bend. And there goes the leg again. Maybe it wants to be off so we can see that all again. So it splits at two points above the knee and below the knee, and that is so awesome. So now with the foot on the ground, there's the leg all the way to the front without the toes leaving the ground. So that, hold on, yeah, there we go. That is pretty good. Let's get that all the way out to the back now. Nice splitting armor once again. Something feels like it cracked in a way it shouldn't, but it hasn't. Everything's holding, that is nice. The splitting armor is pretty cool. As for the side to side then, we've got from there to there, so probably the weakest aspect of the ankle so far. And as for the toe, it can bend down ever so slightly and bend up quite a bit. This armor also moves. So yeah, the articulation and the build on this is definitely a mixed bag. We've got the cool moving armor in the legs, which is beyond impressive, but then at the same time, we do have a few loose parts that are only gonna get looser over time. The ankle articulation and the waist could be a little bit better, 
But once again, this was the first ever real grade, so they did a lot more right than they did wrong. It's still an impressive kit till today. It looks fantastic and it can do a whole lot. It's just, like you can see right there, it does have a lot of issues with loose parts. But otherwise, it's not that bad. So anyway, that right there is it for the review, and there's a lot more good points about this than there is bad, and by definition, this is silver tier, because silver tier means it's exactly what I would expect from a line, and when it comes to real grades, this is what I expect, especially for one that would have the early real grade system, early real grade syndrome, and that pre-built inner frame. Sure, it does have a lot of loose parts, so I always mean to add it to these reviews that if it's a kit for play or a kit for display, this 100% is one for display. Build it, pick a pose, and leave it on your shelf looking fantastic, but don't move it around too much or you're going to degrade that frame inside and end up with a floppy little marionette. But when it comes to the end of the day, this has more pros than it has cons. It looks fantastic. Still one hell of a 144th scale Gundam till this day. Even the accessories are pretty cool. And on the whole, it is a great kit. So what can I say, because it is a simple mobile suit, it holds up pretty okay. There are some real grades out there that still have the pre-built inner frame that have a lot more issues because of what has been piled onto them. Like a lot of the seed kits like the Amatsumina, Freedom, the Destiny to a degree, as well as something like the Sinanju which use the Mark II frame. Those have a lot more issues out of the box than this right here does. So if you're thinking of grabbing one, I still say go for it. It is beautiful and has a level of color separation that is better than some, well, even modern real grades. But anyway, as always, thank you so, so much for watching. Make sure to come back for more Gunpla reviews and I'll see you next time. Anyway, as always, I cannot finish this video without thanking you for watching it because without you, this channel would not exist. And a special shout out to everyone on the channel memberships and over on Patreon, including Tyler Sanders, Brian Perez, Craig Jerry, Caleb Engelhart, and Sean T.